This time, let's share the Word of God with the sermon titled, The Spiritual City of Refuge and the Earth. The earth is small. It's like a grain of sand on the seashore and a tiny dot in the great universe. Then, for what was the earth created? This time, let's study about the meaning in the creation of the earth. God said that He created everything with His intention and meaning in it. Even one clump of grass or a tree was created for a reason. When God Elohim, our Heavenly Father and Heavenly Mother, created the universe, they said they had a will in creating the earth. Then, for what purpose was the earth created? For whom did they create the earth? Scientists formulate various hypotheses and make efforts to prove them. But it is our Heavenly Father and Mother who designed the universe, made human beings, and created life. Through the Bible, they tell us that the earth was not made randomly, but was created with God's great will and meaning in it. Then, what is the purpose of creating the earth? While living on the earth, many people think, why was I born? Life is short, for what should I live on the earth? But many poor souls are just living their lives without knowing the meaning or purpose of life. But I ask you not to regard the earthly life as everything we have, but to understand what it actually is, so that we may have complete repentance and good faith and return to heaven. The earth is spiritually the city of refuge. To put it directly, the city of refuge is the prison for our souls. For what reason was the earth, the prison for our souls, created? For what purpose was it made? When we study the regulation of the city of refuge in the Old Testament, we can understand why we're living on the earth, as they are in a relationship between the shadow and the reality. Moreover, we can learn that we will return to our eternal, spiritual home when we leave the earth. So let's take some time to confirm all these through the Old Testament laws written in Numbers chapter 35. Let's compare the earth and the spiritual world as the earth is given to us as a copy and shadow. The regulation of the city of refuge in the Old Testament laws which you can read in Numbers chapter 35, verse 9, has great implications for us when we study the regulation of the city of refuge carefully. We can learn every important matter about our souls. If we fail to understand the regulation of the city of refuge, which was made as a shadow, we will fail to understand why we are living on the earth and why we must keep the truth of the new covenant. Then, we cannot help but just have a vague faith. To have strong faith, we need to understand this clearly. That's why God said, my people are destroyed from lack of knowledge. Let's see the teachings of God together in Numbers chapter 35, verse 9. Verse 9 reads, Then the Lord said to Moses, Speak to the Israelites and say to them, when you cross the Jordan into Canaan, select some towns to be your cities of refuge, to which a person who has killed someone accidentally may flee. They will be places of refuge from the avenger, so that a person accused of murder may not die before he stands trial before the assembly. 
These six towns you give will be your cities of refuge. Give three on this side of the Jordan and three in Canaan as cities of refuge. The city of refuge is a place where a sinner can flee and stay temporarily. Verse 15 reads, These six towns will be a place of refuge for Israelites' aliens and any other people living among them, so that anyone who has killed another accidentally can flee there. Anyone who has killed someone accidentally means he didn't intend to kill him, but committed a sin unknowingly. It was a mistake. For example, suppose two people were chopping a tree down with axes. But one person's axe had a problem, and the metal blade was separated from the handle, and struck the other on the head, and the other died. In this case, we can say that person killed the other accidentally. He didn't intend to kill him, but that's what happened. For such people to take refuge, God made the regulation of the city of refuge. Now it's explaining about people who killed someone accidentally. Anyone who has killed another accidentally can flee there. Verse 16, If a man strikes someone with an iron object so that he dies, he is a murderer. The murderer shall be put to death. A murderer who killed someone intentionally must be punished, according to the law of the Old Testament. Verse 17. Or if anyone who has a stone in his hand that could kill, and he strikes someone so that he dies, he is a murderer. The murderer shall be put to death. Or if anyone has a wooden object in his hand that could kill, and he hits someone so that he dies, he is a murderer. The murderer shall be put to death. The law states that if anyone killed someone deliberately, he committed wickedness intentionally, and so he must be punished accordingly. Verse 19, The avenger of blood shall put the murderer to death when he meets him. He shall put him to death. If anyone with malice aforethought shoves another or throws something at him intentionally so that he dies, or if in hostility he hits him with his fist so that he dies, that person shall be put to death. He is a murderer. The avenger of blood shall put the murderer to death when he meets him. But if without hostility someone suddenly shoves another or throws something at him unintentionally, or without seeing him, drops a stone on him that could kill him, and he dies, then since he was not his enemy, and he did not intend to harm him, the assembly must judge between him and the avenger of blood according to these regulations. The assembly must protect the one accused of murder from the avenger of blood and send him back to the city of refuge to which he fled. He must stay there until the death of the high priest who was anointed with the holy oil. The city of refuge is for people who killed others accidentally. Let's say someone threw a stone unintentionally, but then a passerby was hit and died. The person who threw a stone didn't target him to kill him. He didn't know the victim and he had no intention of killing him. But it happened accidentally and he died. To help such accidental killers, God let the city of refuge exist. However, it was not for murderers. The rule was, take life for life. And so the family members or the relatives of victims could drag them out and destroy them, even if the murderers fled to the city of refuge. Only those who killed someone unintentionally and accidentally can stay in the city of refuge. However, those who took refuge in the city had to stay there until the death of the high priest 
who was anointed with the holy oil. There was no specific length of time they had to stay, like stay in the city of refuge for a certain amount of years. The only condition was that they had to stay until the high priest anointed with the holy oil died. Suppose someone had entered the city of refuge today due to an accident, but then the high priest anointed with the holy oil dies the next day. Then to him, the next day is the day of release. He can go home freely tomorrow. But what if the high priest lives for 30 or 40 years? Then, the one who has come to the city of refuge today must stay there for 30 or 40 years. As they say in the world, if they are lucky, they can come in today and be released tomorrow. Or on the contrary, they might need to stay there for a long time like 40 or 50 years. The period for which they stay will end when the high priest anointed with the holy oil dies. This is a very important point in the regulation of the city of refuge. God made the regulation that way in order for us to know a very important spiritual point which contains God's will and providence. Let's continue with verse 26. But if the accused ever goes outside the limits of the city of refuge to which he has fled, and the avenger of blood finds him outside the city, the avenger of blood may kill the accused without being guilty of murder. The accused must stay inside the limits of the city of refuge. In other words, it was a prison to him. He must stay in the restricted space called the city of refuge. What if he goes outside the city of refuge as he liked before the death of the high priest? Even if he meets the victim's family and gets killed, he has no one to appeal to for sympathy. This is the law of Moses given by God in the Old Testament times. Let's continue with verse 29. These are to be legal requirements for you throughout the generations to come wherever you live. Anyone who kills a person is to be put to death as a murderer only on the testimony of witnesses. But no one is to be put to death on the testimony of only one witness. Do not accept a ransom for the life of a murderer who deserves to die. He must surely be put to death. Verse 32, Do not accept a ransom for anyone who has fled to a city of refuge and so allow him to go back and live on his own land before the death of the high priest. Those fled to the city of refuge cannot be released before the death of the high priest, even if they pay ransom, which must not be accepted. Verse 33, Do not pollute the land where you are. Bloodshed pollutes the land, and atonement cannot be made for the land on which blood has been shed, except by the blood of the one who shed it. Do not defile the land where you live and where I dwell, for I, the Lord, dwell among the Israelites. Then the one who is the most important position in the law of the city of refuge is the high priest anointed with the holy oil. And all the regulations in the Old Testament law are made by God to enlighten us to the spiritual world. The Bible says that the law in the Old Testament is the shadow, and what happens in the New Testament is the reality. Then today, through the words of truth, we need to learn this. Who is the reality of the high priest anointed with the holy oil in the regulation of the city of refuge, which is the shadow? Let's see Acts chapter 4, verse 27. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you what? Whom you anointed. Jesus Christ is the one God anointed. Let's move to Daniel chapter 9, verse 24. 
Seventy sevens are decreed for your people and your holy city to finish transgression, to put an end to sin, to atone for wickedness, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the Most Holy. Here, the Most Holy is Jesus, as explained in Acts chapter 4, verse 27. Surely, Jesus Christ is the one who fulfilled all the prophecies as the king and the high priest, right? Here, let's think about the city of refuge. Only when the high priest anointed with the holy oil dies, all the people in the city of refuge can go back to their homes. The prophecy was already contained in the law of Moses given by God 3,500 years ago, that all of us can go back to the eternal kingdom of heaven only when Jesus Christ, anointed with the holy oil, dies. Then, was Jesus really the high priest, anointed with the holy oil, on the earth? Let's confirm that through Hebrews chapter 5, verse 8. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And, once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. And was designated by God to be what? To be high priest in the order of Melchizedek. Only when Jesus Christ, the high priest anointed with the holy oil, dies, all the people in the city of refuge can return to their homes. Then, we can confirm that Jesus is the high priest anointed with the holy oil, right? We can clearly understand that it was Jesus Christ that was anointed through the testimonies of the Bible. Then, only those who participate in the precious blood of Christ shed on the cross, can return to their homes that they lost, right? Let's confirm that those people can return to their eternal home country in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 13. All these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. And they admitted that they were what on the earth? They were aliens and strangers on earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. Doesn't that mean that the earth is not a country of their own? Verse 15. If they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had an opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country. Where is it? a heavenly one. Our home is the kingdom of heaven. In Philippians chapter 3, where does it say our citizenship is? It is in heaven. So the kingdom of heaven is our home where our citizenship is. We're temporarily staying on the earth, the city of refuge. For us to return to the eternal kingdom of heaven, who must die? Jesus Christ, who is the high priest anointed with the holy oil, must die and shed his blood. Only by the power of his blood we can receive the grace of returning to our eternal, heavenly country. According to the regulation of the city of refuge in the law of Moses, where are we now? People who can return home only when the high priest dies have gathered on the earth. Then spiritually speaking, what is the earth? It is the city of refuge. In the city of refuge, even if someone has great wealth, great power, great wisdom and knowledge, can he go back home with his own ability? No, he cannot. Nobody can. Only through whose sacrifice can we go back home? The high priest. 
Without the high priest's sacrifice, we can never return to our eternal home. Then, with what truth does the high priest anointed with the holy oil let us participate in the sacrifice of his blood? We just read Hebrews chapter 5, verse 10. Didn't it say the high priest is in the order of Melchizedek? Then, for us to participate in the blood of the high priest anointed with the holy oil and to return to our eternal heavenly home, shouldn't we all belong to the order of Melchizedek? Unless we stay in the order of Melchizedek, we cannot receive the grace of the high priest in the order of Melchizedek. Then, what is the order of Melchizedek? In short, it is the truth of the New Covenant Passover. Some of you may have heard of Melchizedek for the first time. So, let us briefly study about Melchizedek through the book of Genesis chapter 14. We should know who Melchizedek is and give thanks and glory to Heavenly Father and Mother for making us know the new covenant. Let's see Genesis chapter 14, verse 17. After Abram returned from defeating Kedolaomer and the kings allied with him, the king of Sodom came out to meet him in the valley of Shaveh, that is, the king's valley. What did Melchizedek bring out? He brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God Most High. This Melchizedek, who appeared in the Old Testament, blessed Abraham. Through bread and wine, not through any other sacrifices. Since Jesus, too, is high priest in the order of Melchizedek, what did he use when he blessed mankind with eternal life? In the New Testament, we can see Jesus bless his people through bread and wine. All the priests of Israel offered the blood of animals as sacrifice to God. But Melchizedek was different. He blessed Abraham through bread and wine. The Old Testament is a shadow, and the New Testament is the reality. This Melchizedek, who was a shadow and a prophecy, was realized by Jesus. Let's confirm this in Matthew chapter 26. Although today there are numerous churches around the world, those who are not in the order of Melchizedek cannot be clothed with the blood of Christ. If then, can they return to the kingdom of heaven? They can never enter. They can never be clothed with God's grace. Let's look at Matthew chapter 26, verse 17. On the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Where do you want us to make preparations for you to eat the Passover? He replied, Go into the city to a certain man and tell him, The teacher says my appointed time is near. I am going to celebrate the Passover with my disciples at your house. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them and prepared the Passover. Bread and wine that Melchizedek used when he blessed Abraham appear in the scene of eating the Passover. Let's move on to verse 26. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is what? This is my body. Verse 27. Then he took the cup, gave thanks. Of course, this cup is the Passover wine. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and offered it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. After giving thanks for the Passover bread and the Passover wine, 
What blessing did he give to mankind through the bread and wine? According to Psalm 133, God bestows his blessing on Zion. What blessing is it? It is the blessing of eternal life. Melchizedek in the Old Testament times blessed Abraham with physical blessing through bread and wine. Jesus Christ, the spiritual Melchizedek, blessed mankind through bread and wine. Whoever participates in this holy new covenant can receive eternal life. So Hebrews chapter 5 says, Jesus Christ was designated to be high priest in the order of Melchizedek. Let's see the Gospel of Luke chapter 22, Luke chapter 22, verse 7. Then came the day of unleavened bread, on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go and make preparations for us to eat what? To eat the Passover. Where do you want us to prepare for it? They asked. He replied, As you enter the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him to the house that he enters, and say to the owner of the house, The teacher asks, Where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large upper room, all furnished. Make preparations there. They left and found things just as Jesus had told them, so they prepared the Passover. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table. And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. It's because Jesus had to prepare the way and teach the way so that we can enter the truth of the order of Melchizedek. Let's continue with verse 19. And he took bread, gave thanks. Through what did Melchizedek bless Abraham? Through bread and wine. Likewise, Jesus, the spiritual Melchizedek too, blesses mankind through bread and wine. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. He established the truth of the new covenant this way. And the next day, he was crucified. In order to be clothed with the blood of Christ, we must all keep the new covenant. God says to those who keep it, you are my people. You have the citizenship of heaven. You can return to heaven. This earth was created with a certain purpose. From the spiritual point of view, there is no one who has come to this city of refuge without sin. Because all sinned, no matter how grave it was, they have come to the earth, the city of refuge. It is written in the book of 1 John, If we claim we have not sinned, we make God out to be a liar. In Jeremiah chapter 31, Verse 31, let us confirm that we must follow the order of Melchizedek. The time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make what? I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Jesus proclaimed the new covenant through the Passover, didn't he? We've confirmed it in Luke chapter 22, verse 20. Let's continue with verse 32. It will not be like the covenant I made with their forefathers when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be what? I will be their God, and they will be what? They will be my people. In verse 33, God said, I will put my law in their minds. What does my law refer to? God said that he would put the law of the new covenant in the hearts 
of all loving children of Zion. Those who follow the law of the new covenant will be the people of God and God will be their God. These people will be able to enter the eternal kingdom of heaven, right? Let's see verse 34. No longer will a man teach his neighbor or a man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, because they will all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive what? Forgive their wickedness. The death of the high priest, who was anointed with the holy oil in the old law, means the death of Jesus Christ on the earth. The death of Christ was the spiritual process to forgive all our sins. Thanks to His pain and sacrifice, the glorious way for us to return to our heavenly home was opened. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. God certainly said, as long as you remain in the new covenant, I will be your God and you will be my people. The only way for us to return to our heavenly home from the spiritual city of refuge is to be clothed with the precious blood of Jesus Christ, the high priest. Then eternal forgiveness will be made complete and eternal life will be given to us. I hope that we will engrave once again on our heart how precious the truth of the new covenant Passover is, which father and mother have granted us through the prophecy of the Bible. I'd like to finish today's sermon by this. Thank you very much.